In the last video, we defined a quantity called the curl as the circulation per unit area of a vector field about a point. So this is a measure of, uh, if you were to put a paddle wheel in the middle of this vector field, uh, how quickly or it would rotate uh, at a given point in that vector field. And here, this d gamma was the close contour bounding the area element. So for this particular uh, area, d gamma would be the contour here at the bottom enclosing that surface element. In this video, we're going to develop a uh, method to more conveniently calculate the curl of a vector field instead of always having to calculate the, the circulation defined by this closed loop line integral. And just as with the divergence, because the path we take uh, in the circulation is independent of its shape, we're going to take a convenient, uh, a convenient shape about a point. So we have this right-handed coordinate system, x, y, and z. And to simplify the calculation, we're going to take a cube about a given point R located at the center of that cube. And so this will be um, this over here is the point R for which we want to measure the curl. This cube has dimensions delta Y along here, delta X along this direction, and delta Z as a height. Okay, and then the entire surface of this cube is going to be or delta S. So as a particular example, we're going to calculate the circulation about the top face over here of uh, our cube. So this has a normal in this direction. And by convention, we define the positive direction of circulation by the right-hand rule. So if you put your thumb in the direction of the normal, the direction your fingers curl is the direction of positive circulation. Okay. So in this particular case, our normal is just in the k-hat direction. And I'm going to redraw this for convenience. So our square loop is over here in the xy plane. We're doing it about a point r. We're going in this direction. Z is coming out of the page which means by the right-hand rule, we're going counterclockwise. This has dimensions delta x and delta y. And the coordinates of our center point over here, we're going to denote by x, y, and z. So the position where this cube was, was at the plane uh, z is equal to some constant, we're, we're just going to call z. Okay. And once again, this is all in the presence of some vector field v. So because we're working Cartesian, coordinates 
V has the following components. So it has an X component VX, which can be a function of X, Y, and Z, VY, and VZ. And any one of these can be a function of X, Y, or Z. And what we're gonna do then is calculate the circulation of our vector field V about this closed loop. That's enclosing our surface. So remember the cube is our entire surface. We're just calculating about that top loop. Okay, to do this, we're going to break it up into four paths. We're going to call the bottom path over here, gamma one the side path over here, gamma two, the top path over here, gamma three, and the side path over here, gamma four. So if we start over here to calculate the entire loop, we wanna find the line integral along gamma one, plus line integral along gamma two, plus the contribution from gamma three, and the contribution from gamma four. All right, so we can start with the first path. The line integral of that. So by the dot product, this is the same thing as vx dx plus vy dy that's Vz, Dz. But along this path, Y doesn't change. So dy is equal to zero. And because we're staying in the Z plane, Z also doesn't change. So Dz is zero. So along gamma one, Dy and Dz are zero. So our line integral is just equal to Vx dx. Now we have said that the point in the middle, the coordinates of that were x, y, and z. That means that along the path over here, we need the value of the x component of our vector field. along x, y minus delta y over two, because we need to go down by delta y over two to reach this point, and we're staying at z. Now we're gonna play a similar trick to what we did with the divergence and the gradient. We're going to say that this path is so small, so delta x is so small, that along our path going from here to here, this component doesn't vary very much. So we can essentially treat it as a constant along our path, which means that we can take it out of the integral. And only integrate along dx. And this integral is uh, easy to do. This is just equal to the length of that segment delta x. Okay, so a line integral along the first path gave us this expression. Okay, so now that we've calculated the line integral along gamma 1 as being v of the x component of our vector field in x, y minus delta y over two and z. We're going to skip ahead and calculate the line integral along gamma three, which is up here. So in a similar vein, the uh, 
dy and dz are zero along this path. And because we're going in the negative direction, we pick up an extra negative sign. Only the x component of our vector field survives. And we're still, now we're at x, y plus delta y over two, because now relative to this point, we've moved up by delta y over two and said, integrating along dx. Okay, so remember this, mi this minus sign is important. The reason for it is because we're going in the opposite direction uh, that we went over here. And it's similar to what we talked about in the last video about the circulation of two adjacent loops. Once again, along this path, we can say it's so small that V, the X component of V is approximately constant. So we can take it out of the integral. Then we're just left with the integral along the X. which is just, once again, the dimensions of this path. Okay, similarly, if you calculate the line integral along the second path, uh, going along over here, Now, along this path, x remains unchanged and z remains unchanged because we're at the top part of our cube. So dx and dz are going to be zero along here. And the only component that survives is the y component of our vector field. And over here, relative to this point, we've picked up an extra delta x over two. This is along dy. And as usual, we're going to treat this as approximately constant along our path. So this line integral gives us this. And as you might expect, along the fourth path, uh, let's just go through it. Once again, only the y component survives. So we're going along this path over here. So x and z don't change along this path. And now we want the component, the y component of the vector field that x minus delta x over two y and z, dy. And now because we're going in the opposite direction, you pick up an extra negative sign. And again, treating this as approximately constant, you're left with this expression. Okay, so putting it all together, for our closed loop line integral. We wanna add up the contributions from gamma one, gamma two, gamma three, and gamma four. So along gamma one, this was our result. This was line integral along gamma one. Along gamma two, we had this. And 
this was along our second path. Along gamma three, we had this expression over here. This over here was our line integral for gamma 3. And then for gamma 4, we had this one over here. This was line integral along gamma four. All right, so we can combine like terms together. So anything that has a delta x together and anything that's a delta y together. So we first have this term over here. We'll put it in square brackets minus this term over here. And then what you'll notice is this is starting to look like a derivative. You have this funny uh, division by two, but the point is the difference between these two is exactly delta x. So in that vein, we're going to write the x components a little differently, we're going to factor out a negative sign. So that we can get equivalent expressions. So this first term is the one over here with the negative sign factored out. And the second one is going to be the term over here. As I mentioned, these two quantities are starting to look a lot like the definition of a partial derivative. So we're going to divide by delta x over here and multiply delta x out here so that we're not changing anything. And do the same thing here, but with delta y. Okay, so this is for this first term over here, divided by delta x, multiplied by delta x. Similarly over here, we'll divide by delta y multiply by delta y. And as we take the limit that our surface goes to zero, that means our surface over here was delta x delta y. So this becomes infinitesimally small. So as delta x and delta y go to zero, in other words, our surface goes to zero, these expressions turn into a partial derivative of vy with respect to x minus the partial derivative of the x component with respect to y times delta y, delta z, or you can just write delta s. 
So what that means, if you recall the picture we we're looking at, we had our coordinate system, we had a cube around the point we're trying to measure the circulation of the vector field, and we took the circulation about the top face over here, which has a normal vector like that. That means that from our definition of curl, so our normal is k hat, the curl of our vector field was given by that. So as delta x gets smaller and smaller, it's the circulation per unit area. We found that our circulation for this particular phase was given by this times delta s. So that tells us that the k hat component of the curl is equal to the difference of these two partial derivatives. So this is the second component of curl of the curl of v. So an important thing to remember is the curl is a vector quantity, unlike the divergence, which turned a vector field into a scalar. Now, if we were to repeat this process, for other faces that had a normal vector in the i hat direction and a normal vector in the j hat direction, you would get the other two components of the curl. So the i hat component or the x component of curl is given by this. And the j hat component or y component of the curl is given by this expression. And I encourage you to carry out the calculation similar to what we did before, but about two other faces to verify these expressions. So putting it all together, we get that the curl of the vector field It's given by the following. And as you might expect, this is related to the Dell operator that we introduced for the gradient. This is the same thing as calculating the cross product of the Dell operator with your vector field. So our algorithm to compute the curl of a vector field rather than calculating line integrals is we just calculate this quantity over here. In the next video, we'll go through some properties of the curl that we can use to facilitate certain computations and go through some examples.